The area which would become Brownsville, Brooklyn, began as a Dutch church. And that church is still there to this very day in the area of Livonia and Barbie. And it has its own cemetery. Then that was in 1824 and around 1858, a guy named William Sudam bought land in the area. And this is the same Sudam here who, uh, there's a street in nearby Bushwick named after him. But uh, he bought a, he bought some land in the area and subdivided it into lots. But it was difficult for him to capitalize so far because the area was so undesirable. It was pretty much swampland and uh, there were factories all along Jamaica Bay and the glue factories and the fumes, the winds would tend to push the fumes off north up into Brownsville. So wealthy people didn't want to live out there. Plus it was way too far from Manhattan. So he just stopped paying the mortgage and the land went up for auction. And a guy named, who was from New York, named Charles S. Brown acquired the land through an auction and he named it after himself. He called it Brown's Village. Eventually it will be shortened to Brownsville. So this is the guy where Brownsville got its name from, Charles S. Brown. And he proved to be rather cunning because what he did, him and a guy named Elias Kaplan went down into LES, the Lower East Side, which was congested beyond belief and started marketing the area to the poorer Jews he would bring them out there and, you know, pitch the idea like, hey, this is a place you can also not only start a family, but you can start a factory because the, the unions won't mess with you out here. They're too busy down in lower Manhattan. So Jews began to move in and so much so that by the turn of the century, Brownsville earned the nickname Little Jerusalem. It was uh, Russian Jews primarily, by the way, some from Poland, but mostly Russian Jews. Uh, and so then, and mind you, everybody at the time lived in these wooden two-story structures were, which were meant to serve as two-family houses, but in some of them, they would have up to eight families living. So they were fire houses, to say the least. Um, the area didn't have much infrastructure, like uh, running water and paved roads, so people from other areas of Brooklyn would actually come to Brownsville to dump their garbage and dump their sewage. So Brownsville was a tough neighborhood from the get-go. And still is to this very day, but they replaced the wooden structures with uh, brick tenement buildings. Along the same time in 1915, there was a wealthy British guy named Betsy Head, and he was funding the construction of a park in Brownsville. He actually died in the process, so they wound up naming the park after him. And in 1915, in September, Betsy Head Park, which featured a pool, opened up. In 1916, the following year, the infamous Margaret Sanger started the first, one of the first uh, uh, Planned Parenthoods on Amboy Street. Now, fast forward to the era of prohibition and you had uh, the nearby neighborhood of Bed-Stuy began to get overcrowded itself and uh, residents from Bed-Stuy, blacks and Latinos from Bed-Stuy began to slowly move into Brownsville because of the cheap rents and, and, and the factory work. Now this is during the time of prohibition and so crime began to spike, but make no mistake, there was a crime problem in Brownsville long before blacks and Hispanics came. The infamous Murder Inc. The Murder Inc. crew was uh, based out of Brownsville, so crime had long been a problem there. Jewish people did, unlike other neighborhoods in Brooklyn, uh, which the same phenomenon began to happen. The Jewish people did attempt to make uh, uh, to live ha in harmony with the blacks and Hispanics who were, who were moving in. Because um, you got to remember, uh, Brownsville was pretty much the residents there were pretty much uh, left wing socialists. They even got a couple socialists elected into office. And uh, the Jewish people were very, um, very much a part of civil rights protests, uh, Jim Crow protests, um, and getting um, schools, uh, desegregating schools. So they did make an attempt to 
live peacefully among the new residents. This didn't work, however. It came to a breaking point when, in, uh, during the 1950s, the number of blacks in Brownsville doubled, as well as the amount of Puerto Ricans moving into the area. So the breaking point was when NYCHA, which is New York City Housing Authority, decided to build more projects along Livonia Avenue. So as the Russian Jews began to move out into Long Island and Westchester County and some parts of Queens and the blacks and Hispanics continued to move in, there were no jobs because the factory jobs they came for left with the Jews.